Good evening, everybody. I'm Christopher Winks. Hello out there in uh, virtual land and uh, on the San Jordi Festival, New York, and points beyond. Um, I'm here talking with Donald Nicholson Smith, who is the translator of The Treasure of the Spanish Civil War by Serge Pei, which we'll be discussing over the next half an hour. My name is Christopher Winks, as I said, and I'm a professor of comparative literature at Queens College of the City University of New York. And Donald Nicholson Smith is an acclaimed and award-winning translator from French and Spanish who has translated many, many texts from a whole variety of genres, too many to list right now, but suffice to say he has translated people on the order of Guy de Bourg, um, Raoul Van Egem, Paco Ignacio Taibo, and many others. And of course, Serge B, whom we're going to talk about now. The Treasure of the Spanish Civil War was just published by uh, Archipelago Books, um, a very valuable company out in uh, Brooklyn, which I commend their list to your collective and individual attention. So I'm going to ask Donald, first of all, to talk a little bit about this book and uh, this collection of short stories and uh, to maybe give us uh, an excerpt or two from it so that we can all have a taste of uh, what this uh, collection is about. Donald? Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, yes, I'm Donald Nicholson Smith, and I'm the translator of this book. Um, I'll say a couple of words about the author. First of all, Serge Pei, is a, and I'm reading this, so I sound as if I'm reading it. Serge Pei is a prolific French writer, poet, and performance artist who travels widely with his action poetry. He was, but this is something that he invented, and he and he goes around the world. He spent he, he's, he's traveled a great deal in South America and various points around the globe. He was born in Toulouse in 1950 to Catalonian parents who were among the defeated Republicans who fled by foot over the Pyrenees in 1938, or rather 1939, January 1939, in what is called La Retirada, well known to. Um, everybody, I'm quite sure, in Catalonia. Only and as they arrived, all these uh, these refugees, weary from war and from travelling through the snow and ice of the Pyrenees, they were immediately arrested by the French authorities and interned in French prison camps in various points um, along the foothills of the um, Pyrenees. Um, the principal one in the in, in the, the principal one in the beginning was one at Argelès sur Mer, which is a seaside resort on the Mediterranean. And uh, now I have to say that Pei's work is inseparable from his political consciousness and focuses on the intersection of poetry and resistance. Uh, specifically, uh, his parents were some of those Republicans who came across in La Retirada and were immediately interned. And, uh, but he was only born um, in the Spanish community of, of emigres and, and uh, migrants in Toulouse in about 1950. I don't have his exact birth date. Um, but his, he is obviously a child of the Spanish Civil War in the sense that his parents were precisely those people. And his book, his, these stories, which he calls Tales of Childhood and War, they're short stories which, in a sense, reconfigure his his parents' experience. He was obviously too young directly to experience these things, but he, uh, many of the stories involve young boys, children, uh, and the, the thing much of the action is seen through the lens of their um, of their memories. Um, he has a style which sometimes is, I think, wrongly described as magical realism. But it, in fact, it is very literary and in many ways very, very beautiful. I'm going to read from one story, which is called Cherry Thief. And I'll read most of the story, the latter part of the story. 
uh, you simply have to know that it's, it's written in the form of a recollection um, of a young of what it was like as a young boy to steal cherries from his, from his uncle's cherry tree in in the, in the uncle's garden. He had, he had the uncle has a, a little cherry orchard. Uh, it's to be assumed that this, this this is all happening now in France, right? We're not really in Spain anywhere in this book, except sometimes in a rather imaginary way. But basically, everything happens in in France. It's important to understand that and the reality of that, of the, the experience of those concentration camps, which were very very brutal. And some of the stories reflect that. And I'm going to read a, a passage. One morning, however. For an hour now, I had not been stealing, but simply eating the cherries of Tiet Gibraltar. Tiet is Catalan for uncle, and I'm quite sure I have mispronounced it. But anyway, I'm going to call it Tiet Gibraltar, my uncle from the sea, as we like to call him. Mama had sent me to him to get vine shoots for a snail bake. My uncle lived in a refuse dump behind the cooperative. His house was surrounded by a fence made of old planks and tires held together with wire. A well at the bottom of his garden supplied a sandy and salty water that we took care to filter before we drank it. Uncle Gibraltar was short and dark. His crabbed fingers, like licorice sticks, were forever stroking a dog lying between his feet. I always saw him digging in his garden. Uncle Gibraltar was from far away, as his name seemed to suggest. He was not my aunt's husband, though the pair had been shacked up since the Civil War. So he was just a courtesy uncle to me, but you were never to say that he was not married to my aunt. In his garden, my uncle had planted 12 fruit trees in a circle, like the hours on a clock face and to a keen observer their shadows were hands that really told the time. In the center was a majestic spreading fig tree under which my uncle would sit shaded from the sun from spring to fall. Enthroned there on seats from an old stripped car, he watched his own shadow turn and lengthen towards his memories until it turned them around, so they seemed to come from the future. Never did I steal fruit from my uncle. You could steal only beyond the bounds of the family, a circle roughly three kilometers in diameter, as my father counseled me. Once outside that circle, everything was permitted, allowed within it. Within it, nothing was. Such was the law that ensured our peace. Uncle Gibraltar saw me coming from far away, when I was close, a few steps from his shadow, I greeted him with the words, Mama, send me for some vines for the snails. He did not answer me, but pointed to the cherry tree as an invitation to pick the fruit. I had two bags with me and had been counting on taking a few cherries home. Naturally, I stuffed myself like a pig, taking care to swallow a bee, sorry, taking care not to swallow a bee, for which I had become a seriously devoted competitor. I felt Uncle, G I felt Uncle Gab Gibraltar's presence somewhere behind me. He was proud that I was eating his cherries. Then he suddenly came up to the foot of the tree and he said, you don't even know what you're eating. Of course, I replied, on the contrary, I did know that I was eating cherries. No, you're not eating cherries. It is Guillermo Ganusa that you are eating. This tree, this cherry tree is called Guillermo Ganusa. You are eating Guillermo Ganusa. I did not understand. I wondered why my uncle gave men's names to trees, though I knew some people in the village who gave people's names to dogs. True, I had noticed long ago that certain trees bore little signs to their feet carefully branded with mysterious names. But I had assumed that since my uncle was a keen amateur botanist, that these were either the Latin names of the various species of the names or the names of weed killers. And I had never bothered to read them properly. This tree is named Guillermo Ganusa Navarro. 
you never read the sign. You've been eating from it for years, but you don't know its name. Every tree here is a man. I deciphered my uncle's writing and pronouncing each syllable separately, read out the sign at the foot of the cherry tree, Guillermo Canusa Navarro. Intrigued now, I walked all around the orchard. Under the peach tree, the sign read simply, Josep Sabate Nopar. The apple tree bore the name of Antonio Franquesa Fomol. The pear tree was Simon Gracia Flanagan, or Flanagan, I'm not sure. And the plum, Josep Lopez Penedo. At the foot of the lemon tree was a bicycle wheel. And on each spoke a letter on a piece of cardboard, painstaking, in painstaking small capitals, smelt out, spelt out the name Francisco Sabate, letter by letter. Engraved on a birdhouse hanging from the orange tree, in florid lettering were the words Francisco Denis Diaz. In the apricot tree was a smiling photograph of Martin Ruiz Montoya, with a special mention of Barcelona. Directly into the bank of, olive, uh, of the olive tree, my uncle had carved Ramon Villa Cap Capdevila, Caracemada in brackets, and in big capitals, Viva! On the banana tree bark had grown over the first letter of the first name, leaving only Ablo. My uncle had planted a tree for each of his network comrades who had been assassinated between 1949 and 1960. And this one I asked, pointing to the hazel, which had no sign. That one, that one is me. You will inscribe my name on it when I am gone. Okay. That and I'm was... going to leave that. Yes. Yes. Yes, yes. Chris, go ahead. Yes. Uh, the names there of the network are actually, uh, the names I recognize belong to uh, the Spanish underground anarchist militants who after 1939, actually after World War II, um, participated in uh, what uh, the Francoists would have called terrorist exploits, but which uh, they saw as acts of uh, resistance. Now, a little bit of background might be in order because uh, the whole experience of the concentration camp, because that's what it was, Salo, the interior minister, actually used that word. And it's not an episode, this, uh, you know, this uh, detention of uh, several hundred thousand refugees in terrible conditions, most of them suffering disease and most of them experiencing wounds, having been essentially imprisoned behind barbed wire was seen as a great betrayal by the Spanish Republicans. And uh, um, Caraquemada is, you know, Ramon Villa Cap de Villa, who is mentioned with the Viva, was actually um, somebody who escaped from the Argelès-sur-Mer concentration camp, joined the uh, French army um, because World War II had broken out, and uh, the uh, Vichy government actually um, had an order that all the Spanish members of the French army were to be separated and sent off to concentration camps in Germany like Auschwitz. Uh, that is uh, another shameful episode. Kadakemada managed to, which means burnt face, managed to elude that particular situation and he joined the French resistance uh, for several years and uh, was one of those who liberated Paris under the uh, command of Leclerc. It's not usually known that some of the first tanks to enter Paris were given names like Guernica and others and were commanded by uh, Spanish exiles. And Leclerc had promised that uh, after fascism had been, been defeated, then the next step was to go on and uh, liberate Spain from uh, Francoism. Well, that didn't happen. And so people like uh, Caraquemada joined clandestine um, groups that infiltrated uh, over the border, blew up power lines, and he was at it until actually the, there's a little error in the, uh, um, you know, in uh, 
the lat in the uh, dates here because he wasn't shot down by the Francoists until 1963. And figure this that he was 55 at the time and had spent all his life fighting for the what they called the libertarian ideal of anarchist communism. So this particular act of memory, the memory of the trees, the memory of the trees that bear cherries is very important. I recall, of course, the, uh, you know, the old French working people song, Le Temps des Cerises, the time of the cherries, you know, because uh, the cherries are red and they, uh, you know, blossom in the spring. Um, and uh, that is kind of like, a sign of hope, you know, even though all these people like Sabaté, another famous anarchist, had been, had died violently at the hands of the Francoists. So this is, you know, this is, I think, a very important story uh, to read because without using the word anarchist, the, the author Serge Pay indicates by their names to those who know those names that uh, this is what, uh, Uncle Gibraltar is all about, and the fact that he's living in a, uh, you know, in a free union um, is also, I think, important here. So yes. Um, so this is, I think, also, uh, Donald, when you were translating it, you said in your foreword that uh, you wanted to dedicate it to an anarchist veteran who, uh, wrote a memoir of La Retirada and his sojourn in a prison camp. There were more than just Agdelais sur mer, incidentally. There was a whole network, a kind of mini gulag, all, all in the Roussillon area near the Pyrenees. So uh, maybe you want to uh, say what led you to translate this book and what your thoughts were about it in terms of you know, the, the Spanish Civil War and its memories and all the rest. Yes, well, briefly, uh, yes, um, you, you, you're right about this man. I wanted to dedicate it to some, something of a rather sentimental thing that I did, and because I've got no idea what became of him or where he could be now. I don't, don't really, it seems unlikely that he would still be alive. I'm, um, you know, I, I, was a, I was a student at the time. I was about 18 or something, I don't know exactly, but, and I met him, and in my enthusiasm for talking to him about this, his experience in uh, in the south of France, in one of these camps, and he'd written very, he was very attached to the fact that he'd written a memoir of this experience. I very much wanted to translate it for him, but I was being too ambitious, and my life moved on, and I never did get to translate his manuscript, and I felt very guilty about that, in a way, so that was why I wanted to just memorialize him in some rather pathetic way, because I don't really know anything about him, except that he was an anarchist, and he was he had come from those camps, and when I met him, it was at an anarchist meeting in London, when I was, as I say, a teenager, and he was, uh, you know, uh, he was somebody that I, I found very, very appealing. As far as the, the network of, um, of prison camps, it's important to remember that the French had already organised concentration camps all over France, even before this, for dealing with undesirable, undesirable foreigners of one kind or another, because. Of, because when hard times came into France in 1930, they were confronted by the fact that 7% of their population was, were foreign workers. They were Poles, Italians, and Spanish, and uh, this was long before the outbreak of the, even the Civil War. So they had, but when the times changed and they decided that these people became a problem, they started locking them up in, in, in concentration camps, and there were, was already a whole network of con But these ones, for the, when, the, when La Retirada happened, the Spanish... Um, People started arriving by the hundreds of thousands. They had to they had to increase their network considerably. In the end, many of those many of those refugees went to various places, some to South America, Mexico in particular. They were not allowed to go to the United States. They they they, could, they were allowed to go to the Dominican Republic. Some of them went back to Franco Spain. Nobody knows if they, if that was a good idea or not. But they did go back, and they were encouraged very strongly to go back by the French. So there's a whole story concerning these refugees, which which, as I say, were sometimes counted as maybe as many as half a million in total. But those, the numbers are never, every historian seems to contradict the other one on the numbers. The numbers are never seem to be, nobody seems to have very, a very set idea about the numbers. Anyway, 
that's about it. That's I think we haven't got a lot of time, so I'm going to read a bit I more. To ask, I wanted to ask yeah. one more question just very, yes, go ahead, uh, just very yeah. quickly. Um, the implications for today are quite evident, and I wanted to know if you, uh, if, uh, you know what your thoughts were on uh, that because families were separated the conditions of disease in the camps were huge there was typhus and all the you know and all these other you know infections were circulating and uh, um, the the idea of the undesirable foreigner crossing the border the uh, fact that uh, these uh, that these refugees hungry tired starving um, they actually had what little they had taken away from them by the guards. The implications for today are um, immense, you know, and this is, of course, happening, um, you know, 85, almost, you know, 80 some years later. So uh, I wanted to know your thoughts on that, you know, as well. Well, my thoughts are simply that you're absolutely right. I mean, and of course, the, with this book, one continually reminded of, of the fact that we're living through similar times now in Europe and the, you know, and of course in the States as well, and, you know, mutatis mutandis, it's very much the same situation. So yes, of course, I mean, it's, um, you know, it's as if um, anybody who felt that we got rid of the 20th century were completely wrong. Mm -hmm. That's how I would put it. It's yes. very much still with us. Yes. And this became and, clear, first of all, to me in the time of, of the breakup of Yugoslavia, which, as far as I'm concerned, was uh, an incredible failure of the mandate of the uh, European Union, because that, the, the idea of that union was that the conditions of World War II would never return. They did return in Yugoslavia, mm -hmm. and they have returned now in terms of dealing with this, uh, with, with so-called migrants or whatever, refugees, whatever mm -hmm. name they're given. You know, the force of population movements are just, in any case, quite inevitable. But the cruelty that goes along with the, with the way in which they're dealt, the, the, the way that people deal with them is, is a permanent feature of the landscape. And this, so this book does have very many echoes of the present moment. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I agree with you about that. Yeah, very, very yes. similar. In, the, in parts of it, they describe the uh, conditions in some of these, he describes conditions in some of these concentration camps. And um, it's very, very brutal. And the last story, bit of a bit that I have time to read, uh, will bring that out a little bit. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, you will see that it's, you know, that it's not some, it's something pretty relevant to us today. Uh, all you need to know in the in in the, in the run up to this passage is that. Um, um, it's the arrest. Is right? that the man? The man that, that's telling the, the first person narrator is basically um, has been arrested. The story is called the arrest. He's been arrested because he's been forging documents for a long time, and eventually he gets found out. He gets betrayed, and he gets arrested. So he's now he's been um, he's been taken in by the the police. And I, I read now from the, the book. I was thrown onto the concrete floor of a bathroom. Every morning, two men came to take me out for interrogation. I recognized one of them, a former messenger boy who had opened a flower shop in the neighborhood. I also recognized the house of a trade union lawyer who had been arrested two years earlier. I'd never been to his house, but I was shaken to see men in white, sh in white shirts with rolled up sleeves occupying it. His book, books once visible from the street, had disappeared from the library, along with the pictures. Now only the chandelier continued to shed its light. It occurred to me that light was neutral and could illuminate anything at all. To ask a question is to understand the answer. A question mark is a rearing snake that bites every answer to death. A question strength is attack. An answer's strength is defense. The challenge, therefore, is to respond in, the, in an inter interrogative way to a question. Every response must itself turn into a snake, into a question mark. I refuse to answer these questions. I simply, their questions, I'm sorry. I refuse to answer their questions. I simply stated that a man unknown to me would leave in my mailbox a photo and the address of the person for whom I was supposed to forge papers. I didn't say how I used to look for names in the graveyard, 
nor that I found the day and month of dates of birth in the annals of the great freedom fighters of our world. When I finished the job, I told them I would hang a bed sheet in my, gar in my garden along with a pair of pants. If the pants were to the left of the sheet, it meant that the work was done and that I would put the, put the papers under the pot of flowers facing the street. Whether it was the milkman who picked them up or the newspaper man on his bike or a road worker, I never knew. I told them nothing. I gave no, I gave no names. Something inside me, beyond pain or hope, chose not to talk. I said no, so to speak, in order to exist. A no older than the universe, a sign of creation set against the void, but a no beyond yes and no, a negation from a sense of honor greater than, greater than any of us. I did not talk. Every morning in the interrogation room next to the bathroom, I was bolted to a rack and immersed in a tub. When I was lifted out, the water was red. This went on for three weeks. Then came a morning when I was thrown into a railroad car with about a hundred comrades. My friend Sayas had managed to conceal a file, a rat tail file, a round file, beneath the truss he wore as a disabled person. That file was our one and only hope. We both smiled. And at the beginning of the journey, we talked about the number of tools named for animals. Terminette for a stoat, which means stoat in French, for an adze, chevre or goat for a hoist, and pied de biche, sorry, pied de biche or deer's foot for a crowbar. We wondered whether it was animals who taught humans how to labor. Inside the car, we took turns sitting down. We also took turns pissing through the gaps between the floorboards onto the rail bed below. With a few others, I resolved to escape. But many comrades were afraid. They pointed out that there were soldiers watching us on either end of the car's roof. The prisoners' eyes were bright with their secret hope of surviving. I knew that hope could trump survival. I also realized that hope never abides by a majority view and that and just like freedom, it is independent. So despite the handicap of our small number, we decided to escape. There were some who sought to prevent this, trying to convince us of the hopelessness of our initiative. A scuffle ensued and we had to fight to facilitate our escape. I don't enjoy recounting the episode in the rail car because it still pains me to say that I fought some of my own who were under the illusion of being alive. It was hard to believe that the spirit of the enemy was manifesting itself in our car. The enemy was almost right there amongst us. Our comrades, without wishing to, had allied themselves with our captors. To attempt escape, we now had to see them as enemies. Not completely, however. Those comrades were provisional enemies only. I realized that you have to know how to fight those who do not want to free themselves in order to make their liberation possible. The railroad car had, had, had served to transport cattle, its stank of liquid manure and straw. I reflected that we were cattle also, but that what made the difference from cattle, made us different from cattle was the basis of our hope, not survival. Cattle no more want to die than most of the comrades in that car did. The difference between cattle and us was that even if we could not avoid each other, we could escape. It is not our ability to speak or to string words together that makes us different from cattle, but the fact that we ally those words with something that words know nothing of. So long as speech does not embody hope, it is no more than bellowing. We fought with our own, and then I made a hole in the car's door one of us reached his arm outside and unslid the bolt. A few minutes later, as the train slowed down on a bend, we all threw ourselves out and tumbled into a ravine. The soldiers on the car's roof fired at us, but we were already too far away and under cover of rocks and trees. Here for your consideration are a few lessons I learned that day. First, the struggle to escape from a railroad car often begins 
among the passengers and not by engage, among the passengers and not by engaging the soldiers guarding the transport because a good number of those passengers are unaware of their degree of confinement. Secondly, hope is a hole made in the side of a rail car. Thirdly, any captive passenger in the car must invent a new, impossible way out of the car as opposed to the possible one. Fourthly, those who remained in the car and did not wish to escape were nevertheless shot. Thank you, Donald. That, that's, that was, that's the end, yeah. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. And uh, let that be a message to all of us that regardless of confinement, the struggle continues. Thanks, Chris. Th thanks Thank for, you. for this little conversation. Perhaps Thank we can continue too. it at some greater length before too long. I hope so too, Donald. And thanks whoever's listening. I hope you enjoyed this little interlude. Bye Thank for now. You. Bye for now.